So welcome to today's mini masterclass. Uh, today we're talking to Fiona Wright. Fiona Wright is an editor, a writer, a critic from Sydney. Uh, she's written a number of books of uh, essays and poetry as well. Her book of essays, Small Acts of Disappearance, Essays on Hunger, won the 2016 Nita B. Kibble Award and the Queensland Literary Award for Nonfiction and was shortlisted for the Stella Prize and the New South Wales Premier's Douglas Stewart Award. And her first poetry collection, Knuckled, won the 2012 Dame Mary Gilmore Award, while Domestic Interior was shortlisted for the 2018 Prime Minister's Literary Award for Poetry. And her most recent book of essays, The World Was Whole, was longlisted for the Stella Prize last year and has been shortlisted for this year's New South Wales Premier's Award. And as we pre-record this today, we're about four or five days out from the announcement. So by the time this mini masterclass is up on the uh, up on the platform, we will know whether you've won or not. But as for you right now, Fiona, <laughs> you don't know. No, I do not. And that's okay. That's it's um it's a real honor to be on the short list of things like that. It really it really does mean a lot. In my introduction I mentioned that you're a writer, an editor, a critic and a poet. And uh, we did arm and ar about what we're going to ask you to talk about today, but we've sort of settled on writing memoir because I think that was what a lot of us kind of first knew you for with your book of essays, Small Acts of Disappearance. Um, mm -hmm. So you're happy to talk today about uh, life writing and have some pointers for people who might be interested in doing some life writing or memoir. Is, is there a difference between life writing and memoir? Um, probably, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure what any of the actual delineations are and I always say to um, other like emerging writers in particular that categories are useful as long as they're useful um, right. you know so if, if it means something to you to call your work memoir or life writing or essays then go for it um, if it doesn't make a difference then then don't worry <laughs> I think where I think where it gets a little bit curly is when you're someone like James Frey and you you claim that it's memoir and it turns out it was all made up that 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 doesn't tend to end well does it oh, yes <laughs> we've had a couple no, of Australian no. versions of that too haven't we yeah I am fascinated by that though because you know there is a kind of a necessary level of fictionalization that goes on um, even in the most truthful of, of memoirs. Um, so I can see how easy it would be to, to slip into complete fabrication if you let yourself. I mean, one of the books that you, you have been involved with, I think you, you either mentored or edited or were involved in, in the, the Girls by Chloe Higgins, who, and Chloe's done some work for West Words as well. Um, and she, in her yeah. book, she, she does a lot of kind of saying, well, this is the way I remember it, but I'm told by other people that, is, that it wasn't this way. So I guess that's starting to blur those lines already between memory and fact, isn't it? Yeah, and, you know, I think, I think that's a really clever and, and honest thing that, that Chloe's done in that book too. Um, you know, my approach has always been quite different. You know, I, I think my own point of view and my own subjectivity is really important to the books and it's and it's right up there it's right in front you kind of um I don't think I don't think you could ever get the impression that I was trying to tell an absolute truth of anything it's really about my experience of these things um so it, it doesn't concern me in the same way if my if people in my life remember things differently um and of course I also blur um you know, blur facts and, and characters at times to kind of, you know, preserve people's privacy and mm. um, try to make sure no one hates me. <laughs> I suppose in, in a kind of meta way, the, the, the subject of that first book of your small acts of disappearance, which focused on eating disorder and so forth, um, I suppose the way that reality and self-perception and those sorts of things clash and combine is really at the heart of that, isn't it? Yeah, Absolutely. Um, both in the in the way the book began, um, and I think where the book ends up by by the last essay as well. I really I started writing that book um, after my very first hospitalisation, which was in a in a day program. Um, so I'd go to the hospital in the morning um, and stay until mid afternoon, and I'd do that four days a week, and then we had three days to ourselves. And I'd, and I'd been in treatment for a few years by that stage, but it was the first time I was ever in really close contact with um, other eating disorder patients. And up until that point, um, I really had considered my illness quite 
different because it developed out of a physical condition, um, a condition called rumination syndrome, which is like a tick in the top of the stomach that I have no control over, um, but does make eating difficult for me. Uh, and I genuinely believed for years and years and years that the, the way that I was eating, even when I was eating very, very minimally, was what I needed to do in order to manage that physical condition and that I was different from um, people with eating disorders. And then I met people with eating disorders and had this moment where I was like, oh, dear, everything I'm hearing here, everything I'm seeing here, um, you know, could have come out of my own mouth, could be a reflection of myself. And it was a moment where I had to kind of then step back and reconsider everything I'd been telling myself about myself and about my illness and about my life for you know the entirety of my adult life by that stage Mm. and so the essays kind of came about as a way to as a way to do that to kind of think through some of the issues some of the ideas um my own my own sense of self and I and I think that's very much the the through line of the book my my thinking and and my kind of weighing up for want of a better term, (laughs) Um, the the kind of different perspectives um, and the things that were shifting and changing inside of me. Yeah, it's kind of, it's interesting because as you were talking about that, I was just thinking, I was looking at some of your, the blurbs on the, um, on your website earlier about your books and the word addiction comes up in the blurb for Mm. small acts of of disappearance. So it's funny when you were saying there that, you know, this, this wasn't me. This is these other people. They were the ones with the eating disorder. I was just had this kind of unique thing, and it kind of reminded me of that. You know, the ga- people with gambling addictions going, "Well, I don't have a problem with gambling. It's, it's those other people over there yeah. that have been sitting there for four hours. They're the ones with the problem, but I can stop anytime." <laughs> well, it's it's funny, you know. I have um, one of the one of the really interesting things about the book's reception was obviously I had a lot of people with eating disorders in their past or in their present or in their family get in touch with me and, and um, you know, tell me what the book meant to them in their own stories, which, you know, is kind of not that surprising in hindsight. But actually a lot of kind of former addicts of, you know, um, drug addicts and alcoholics um, kind of said similar things as well. So I do think there are a lot of, a lot of overlaps in the thinking um, in one sense and, and in that process of trying to build a new life for yourself and pull yourself out of, kind of something that seems to be so entrenched um, in your day-to-day life. It's interesting what you were just saying there because you've taken the conversation in a particular direction uh, towards a question I was actually going to ask you, but it might now be a good time to ask you this. Full disclosure, I used to work at the Children's Hospital in um, in Westmead uh, on, the oh, adolescent, yeah. on the adolescent unit as it happens. Um, mm. But uh, there was a, a young girl uh, with um, cystic fibrosis and she she asked me one time, about writing her life and she said how do I go about writing it what do I write about and my advice to her was at the time write down everything and then sit back and work out what it is you're really trying to talk about are you talking about your family relationships are you talking about you know the fact that you couldn't have a boyfriend that could be like a regular boyfriend because you're always spending time in mm-hmm. hospital or whatever so I, I wanted to ask you what what do you think is a better better approach for someone who wants to write memoir do you write down everything you've got and then go, now what are the themes that I want to explore here? Or do you go, I have a theme I want to explore now, how do I backfill that from my own experience? Is there a, a better way to approach that? I don't, I don't know if it's, a, if it's a better way, but my way has always been to start with the themes. And I think that's because the sort of writing I'm interested in or the, or the stuff that I seem to be able to do is about, it's really about um, the self in the world and the kind of the experiences that I've had that to me speak of bigger issues in the world. One of my favourite essayists is, is Leslie Jamison. Um, she wrote a book called, her first book was called The Empathy Exams, which came out while I was writing Small Acts and, and really kind of helped me. But she kind of talks about the work of an essay being to draw together the kind of, what she calls the perpetual mess um, of, in your life of how bigger forces like politics, um, economics, uh, you know, cultural ideas play out. So there's this kind of these abstract ideas that we can kind of think about, but we can't care about them um, in the same way that that we do when they're kind of connected to 
somebody's life and, and somebody's experience. And that, and that makes a lot of sense to me that, you know, a lot of, a lot of small acts is about, you know, questioning these ideas of how we build a self. Um, there's a lot of kind of gendered stuff in there, what it means to be a young woman in the world and kind of a, a particular type of, of person too. And the, and as far as the world as a whole goes, I was really sort of thinking in that book about um, ideas about home and belonging and um, and how we might think about home and belonging in a world that's sort of more unstable uh, for people of my generation than it was for my parents' generation, for example. So the old narratives don't kind of fit in the same way. Um, and then sort of wider questions about what it, what it means to try to live with an illness long term too and so for me it's always been a case of thinking about the themes or, or thinking about the questions usually what happens when I start an essay is um I get I get very obsessed with with the questions like an itch in my brain um and and often something happens in my life that crystallizes that or I've just been reading a lot on a particular subject and I'm trying to figure out why I'm obsessed with it and why I can't quite let it go can you give us an example from can you give us an example from your from one of your um, essays? How how that process worked? Yeah, when I when I kind of joke about a lot was um, when I was about a year and a half into writing the world was whole. I, I knew I was writing a book about home um, and and kind of domesticity in in many ways at that point, and was just starting to kind of pull together ideas around that, and we got evicted. Um, <laughs> So suddenly I was like, oh, interesting. I'm a term renter um, because, you know, I live in Sydney and I'm, I'm a millennial. It, um, I don't eat avocado toast, but that's, an, but that's another story. So I have a very different experience of what home and housing is like to my parents' generation. And part of that is instability and not knowing how long you're going to be in a house for. And I started thinking about what it means to, to build a home um, under those conditions and especially the part where you know it's it's temporary and that the decision to leave is probably not going to be yours. So that was a kind of really nice moment of life kind of giving me the, the impetus um, to kind of crystallise the vague ideas that were swimming around in my head, if so that what, makes sense. So what was, the next, what was the next step in your process for that essay then once you went, okay, so I've just been evicted, I'm now, I now have suddenly had this epiphany that this is what, a, what belonging means for my generation, it's going to be different from previous generations and maybe future generations. What was the next step in, in the development of that particular essay? In that particular case, I went and did more research, um, which is something I'm always going to do because I'm a giant nerd and I love reading and actually the research is my favourite bit. Mm. It's easier than the writing. In, in that case, I thought that in order to really build a strong case about what I was saying, I would need to prove to people who didn't have my experiences that it wasn't just me in, in this particular boat. So I went and did a, a, a lot of research on statistics really how many people, um, you know, what proportion of Australians rent at the moment, um, how that divides by age group, um, how many of those people are spending more than 30% of their income on rent, which is what's technically known as um, housing stress. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a whole bunch of the the individual tenants unions in the states had put uh, in the various states here had put together a really great report into some of the inequalities in the system um, which was a really great resource so I sort of so I read a lot of that and then was finding the parallels between those statistics and the parts of the story where I was one of those statistics as it were it's funny isn't it that yeah you know, the the main difference between an essayist, in a, in a sense, and say a social ecologist or a sociologist or a town planner, mm. is you, you you each have to get the your head around those details and those statistics, if you like. But where you go with them next is is what is the differentiating factor. I think. And for example, I, I haven't read the piece that you're describing, but I can't I can't imagine that you had tables of statistics in there. But you had to have your head around those, right? Yeah, yeah, and I, you know. Um, I, I sort of focused on this one report that was in quite accessible language too, which was really helpful to me. Um, it, it's funny, you know, I have, a, I have a spiel that I give students often 
where I kind of start by talking about one of my very good friends who's a bioinformatician and a statistician. So their job is to kind of collect data, um, usually on, on illnesses. They do a lot of work with cancer statistics. Um, and their interest in that comes from the, it's a, it's a kind of quest to make meaning, to gather these numbers together and plot them out um, in a way that gives meaning to these experiences that people have had. And I always joke that I think it's the exact same thing that I'm doing, um, gathering up this data to kind of make meaning out of the kind of chaos of the world. It's just that the data my statistician friend is using is purely quantitative. It's all numbers. Um, it's all kind of hard, sharp data. And the stuff that I'm interested in is qualitative data. So what does this feel like? What does this look like? What does this, what does this mean on an emotional sense? But it's the same impulse. It's, it's really just about making meaning and ordering the kind of messy stuff of our lives. It's interesting, uh, this intersection you're talking about between statistics and, and, and public health and that sort of thing too. I mean, there's the Judy Harris uh, Fellowship through the Charles Perkins Institute, and I believe you've come pretty close to snagging that a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, pretty close. Yeah, I'm uh, not, no sorry, to, sorry to remind you. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, for those who, who don't know, this is um, the Charles Perkins Institute. is a public health institute at Sydney University, and they have this uh, $100,000 uh, fellowship for a writer or an artist to come in and actually just basically write about something to do with public health. And they're trying to find that intersection between or trying to exploit that intersection between art and statistics and science and trying to put those things. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I put that very well, Fiona. Are you able to put any more meat around those bones? Yeah, I, I think I think it's a really fascinating um, initiative. And, you know, I've, I've applied for it every year because, you know, A, it's, it's a dream job um, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of money, especially for a writer. Yeah. But it, it, it really does align with a lot of my interests, which, you know, a lot of my writing is about health and illness and the body it, purely because these, these things are really pertinent in my life, you know, as a person with a chronic illness or a disability um, I think they're pertinent for women in general too. You know, they're, they're a really multidisciplinary centre, so they work with, you know, mathematicians, medical people, um, sociologists, politicians, mm. well, not, uh, like political scientists, kind of really disparate faculties with the idea that when you put um, unexpected people together, that's when you get unexpected results. And that's what we need for tackling kind of big chronic health problems. Yeah. And everyone there is is really interested in the creative processes of science, mm. which aren't that dissimilar to to what we do as writers. Well, um, that's right, isn't it? I mean, what you're talking about with your yeah. process, you, you identify a question that needs to be answered, and then you go and you find the statistics behind that. And then you explore um, the implications of that and what we can do to improve the outcomes of these things it's not actually you're right it's not that different from the scientific process is it yeah yeah and you do a bunch of thought experiments you know and I, I think too that the one of the things I love about essays is that you, you don't actually have to solve them you it's it's sort of the thinking and the asking mm. that's important um and the more I learn about science the more I realize that that's actually what science is like too that the kind of gains in knowledge are small and incremental and the, the real work is in kind of asking and exploring and, and seeing what happens. At risk of stretching the, um, the analogy too far, the other thing to do, <laughs> the other thing about science is that occasionally you'll head down a particular path looking for an answer to one thing and you'll notice something else on that path and go, actually, that's actually a much more interesting question. I think I need to ask that one now or when this one's done. How Have you in your in your practice, as you've been writing nonfiction and essays and so forth, have you ever headed down a path thinking you're attacking one particular theme and partway through that suddenly going, actually, I'm not as interested in that as I am in this new thing I've just spotted? I think, I think that happens more and more now, actually. I think that happens to all writers on book length projects. Um, you know, there's, there's been a few essays that I've kind of half written and had to abandon for a little while and just waited for things to crystallise a bit. Um, and there's also been essays that I thought have been a part of a particular book project and then in the end they didn't fit in. But I know that for, for both of my prose books, um, 
what I thought I was writing about when I started them and started pulling ideas together and started pulling essays together isn't where I ended up at all. So, you know, small acts I kind of, I thought was going to be a much more um, theoretical exploration of the idea of hunger. And, and that's there, um, especially in the, in the early essays, but, but really the story in that book is um, just me trying to figure out what the hell had happened to me and kind of the process of navigating that and, and reframing, reframing how you think of yourself. It was a much more interesting process in The World Was Whole because I started writing that book thinking that it was going to be about homes and, and belongings, the idea of home and, and how, you, how you belong there, which is something that's always interested me, in part because of where I grew up and, um, and moving away from that space and having to kind of re, rethink all of those things. And as I kind of kept going with that, and then I started t- talking about it as a book about ordinariness and routine and habit because those things are kind of tied up in your sense of belonging and your sense of place and sense of home. And um, I think especially for um, a disabled person, um, those kind of rituals and routines are so much more important to us because our our worlds are very often smaller and more domestic. It's harder for us to go out. And it's kind of the experience that a lot of people are having now in in quarantine and in isolation, having to find new routines Mm. and rituals that are kind of centred in these smaller spaces. So I've been really interested to watch that. In our particular family, we've got a four-year-old living with us now and, um, Mm. you know, my grandson. And and here we are all having dinner now at 5.30 so that he can have his bath and go to bed. And so we were all... (laughs) Just just the simple rhythms of the day have had to shift a lot uh, just through that. Yeah, and one of the things I've you know I've got I've got housemates and um, I, I think they've both kind of been like the days feel so much longer when they're not broken up by travel between workspaces yeah. and um, and the space that you're in is so much more important because it doesn't change. So I was sort of thinking through a lot of a lot of these ideas and would say things like oh you know small acts was very much a book about extremity so I'm thinking about this book is very much its opposite. It's about ordinariness and mm. trying to make a case for that as important and beautiful and um, kind of it gets overlooked in a lot of our stories. And then um, when I wrote the essay that ended up being, it's the second last essay in the book, but it was the very last essay that I wrote. Um, I wrote about doing a writer's residency in, in Shanghai and China is, is a country that I had wanted to go to since I was a teenager. Um, we studied Chinese history in school and I was obsessed um, and I did uh, language at university kind of on the back of that and had always, always wanted to go there and never made it. And, of course, one of the reasons I never made it was because I got sick and travel suddenly became a thing that's much harder for me to do. But I wanted to write about living in a different city with a very different sense of what home is like and different kind of cultural mores about why it's important and how you use it. But when I got there, I felt like I kept coming into contact with my teenage self who'd so wanted to be in that place all those years ago. Um, And the kind of vision of the adult I was supposed to be before I got sick. And it was deeply distressing and Mm. and sad Mm. and made me realise that the whole book had actually been a book about grief. And about that idea of letting go of the adult you're supposed to grow up into and coming to terms with being of, of the life that I have to have now. You know, so I, I think, and I think that's a really common experience that the kind of more time you spend on something and the more thinking you do about it, the more you realise there's something else going on that you probably weren't conscious of at the very beginning yeah. you know but I had this sense that maybe there could have been a step I took where I didn't get sick and everything would have been easier if nothing mm. else which is you know it's it's crazy thinking it's silly and it and it doesn't matter but it's hard to it is a hard process to let go of the idea that you might recover um or, or rediscover some old true self you know sort of sitting there beneath the illness even after all these years so we're going to wrap up in a minute because we that, the time is flying past, but I had a couple of other very quick points I wanted to uh, raise with you. Uh, you haven't used the term beauty in the mundane, but that's, I think, what, we're, what we are talking mm-hmm. about. And the, the definition of mundane is that it's lacking interest or excitement or it can be quite dull. How do, how do we find beauty in that? 
you know, I used to I used to argue that this was because of my training as a poet that you know so much of poetry is about paying attention and paying attention to small things um, and and details and honouring them. You know that it's such a kind of momentary craft that's really grounded in in the world, um, and it's sort of it's sort of the way I think too. So it kind of felt like a natural way to go about things. I, I like surprising juxtapositions, and um, it kind of it kind of made sense to me. And I've I've since found out that this may actually be a peculiarity of the way that my brain works that an attention to detail or a focus on detail is something that happens in the brain um, as a result of malnutrition. But uh, I've also <laughs> I've also been going undergoing diagnostic screening at the moment for autism um, because it kind of manifests quite differently in women and there were kind of a few red flags that came up. Turns out it's a, it's a symptom of that as well. So it may just be that this is the way my brain works um, and... Fortunately, that's kind of provided an engine for my writing, which I think of as a as a kind of really happy accident in that sense. You know, but I also think that the small things in our world are the things that we don't pay attention to. And the things that we don't pay attention to are the ones that we accept as natural and normal mm. and the way things have to be. And and that's just not the case. You know, everything is built, everything is designed, everything has kind of meaning underneath it and I'm interested in the ones that we don't look at more so than the ones that we're accustomed to thinking about. Yeah, my, one of my favourite painters is um, is Geoffrey Smart and he was very, mm. very much about beauty in the mundane, painting, you know, huge office blocks or or concrete barriers down the middle of a highway and uh, I remember one of, I was seeing the sketches of one of his paintings at one point which was one of these concrete barriers on the highway and he had all these sketches that didn't quite work he couldn't work out why until on one of them he painted a loop of hose that was just hanging over the edge of ah. the concrete barriers. And when you see that sketch, you go, yes, I don't know why, I don't know why that makes a difference, but suddenly the suggestion that there has been somebody interacting with that mm. world with that tiny detail, it just brings the whole thing to life, even mm. though there's not much, much different apart from a, a stroke of green paint, really. Yeah, yeah, but it's the human scale brought brought into the kind of, yeah, that's really interesting. The last thing I wanted to ask you about detail was uh, it mentioned in one of your blurbs here that the details, uh, the anxiety that is wrapped up in detail. Are you able to mm. explain what that means? Well, that was my publisher who wrote that. Right. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you want to just, just move on or are you happy to explore it? <laughs> no, no, I, I think what he was kind of picking up on, because um, my, my publisher is a, I, and he's my editor as well and is very astute, um, a kind of really excellent reader and, and a great editor for, for precisely those reasons. Mm. Um, and I, But I think part of what he, he was thinking about is the way that kind of intense focus on small things can kind of very easily become overwhelming when there are so many of them. Um, but it's also kind of symptomatic, I guess, of not being what psychologists would call in the moment, as much as I hate that phrase, um, <laughs> that there are things that you notice when you're not kind of, when you're in the world but not of it, um, <laughs> as the other saying goes, that sense of kind of sitting slightly separate from things that you kind of see and notice things that other people might not because they're too wrapped up in what they're doing and, and having a grand old time. Um, which is a thing I envy sometimes, mm. but it's just not the way I'm built. Well, I found, I found the exact <laughs> I, quote here. It was, uh, anxiety lurks in domestic spaces. It inhabits the most oh. ordinary objects like a drill bit or a phone charger. <laughs> it's not a bad line though, is it? <laughs> it's, a, it's a great line. It's a great line. Um, yours, there, you know, there's a real art to writing those blurbs. Um, yeah. You know, I, I worked as, a, as an editor for a little while and it was my job to draft those and, and God, it would take forever you know, because you've only got a paragraph or two to summarise an entire book mm. and kind of with my writer hat on, if I could summarise a whole book in a paragraph or two, I wouldn't have to write the damn thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's very tricky business. Devil in the detail in a whole other way, yeah, indeed. Um, That's right. So finally, Fiona, um, what would be your best piece of advice to somebody who was either had a, either wanted to write their own story or wanted to 
write essays about their personal experience or whatever? What would be your best piece of advice for someone like that? Well, I have I have two. Um, okay. Yeah, well, and, you have two. we'll have a bonus one. Go on. Yeah, you get a bonus one. Okay. Um, and I and I draw on these because I think of them as the best pieces of of advice that I was ever given. And the first one is to read and read widely and you know, read things that relate to what you're doing and read things that don't relate to what you're doing because that's really how you learn your craft as a writer is is by reading by reading and by writing. So sitting down to actually do it is is also important. But reading will give you the tools that you need um, to, you know, go ahead and do what you want to do. And the other one, which I think is is even more important, um, it was a poet friend once who who stole this from somebody else, but the line is to trust your obsessions. Mm. Um, which is to to say that if there is something that you can't stop thinking about, something that is interesting to you and fascinating to you and and kind of give you have an obsessive interest in, go with that, write about that, think about that, because it's not going to be just you who will find that interesting. If you're interested in it, there's going to be someone else in the world who's interested in it as well, and your kind of attention to it will make it interesting to other people um, and you'll have a great time as well, which is, you know, important. All right. I love that one. Trust your obsessions. That, that's really good and which is which is a good segue for me to go and start my five-volume set about donuts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Fiona, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Um, your website, if anybody wanted to check out your work, is fionawright.net, is that correct? That's right, yep. Well, thank you so much for talking to us and we'll probably hit you up at some point for a chat about uh, some of the other things that we could have spoken with you about. Uh, but for today, Absolutely. yeah. So for today, thank okay. you so much for being, spending time with us. And thank you so much for having me. It's, it's, it's been great.